Okay, so yeah, I'm Jack Van Lightly. I work at Confluent, which is the main company behind Apache Kafka. So I'm a bit of a messaging systems guy, and I've been using TLA Plus for a number of years, doing all kinds of stuff in RabbitMQ, Pulsar, and Kafka with TLA Plus. Um, so back in 2020, uh, I was involved, or at least I was reviewing a new client library for RabbitMQ, and I had seen that I thought that the library had some problematic liveness properties, and so I decided to write a simulation. And I wrote it in Python, because at the time it had not occurred to me to use TLA plus for this. And I collected a bunch of statistics, put it out into CSV, put that into Google Sheets, and generated some charts. And uh, I was pretty happy with myself, and I was able to show that the sort of P95 and P99 uh, uh, statistics were not very good, basically. And so I was pretty happy with myself, tweeted about it, and then Marcus was like, hey man, you know you can do that in TLA plus if you use simulation mode and TLC get and set. And so that's how this little project began. Uh, and over the last two years, it's been stop and start. But uh, yeah, but it's not just me. And Marcus talking about simulation and distributed systems. Uh, Mark Brooker, who is at AWS, has been tweeting and blogging about simulation to understand better liveness properties, probabilistic properties. So I highly recommend you also read Mark's materials. So why do we want to measure the statistical uh, properties through simulation? Well, statistical properties in themselves can be very useful because sometimes what the protocol maybe that you've designed might be safe, but actually maybe it just takes too long to complete. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why it might not actually be a good design. Now, you can use statistics to calculate a lot of these properties, but if you're like me, I'm just a regular engineer, my statistics aren't so good, I can write code and I can write simulations and get uh, empirical data. And so that's why I like simulation. One nice thing about TLA plus based simulation is that we don't have any of the programming uh, you know, system level noise that can creep in. It's entirely logical and very reproducible. So now we can also evaluate hyper properties. So we can take a property and we can know whether is it rare? Does it happen a lot? Uh, right now with liveness, we know that eventually something good will happen, but we don't know how long will it take? You know, how many messages have to be exchanged for this good property to actually occur? Uh, we can identify worst case and pathological behaviors. And one of the neatest things is differential analysis. So we can compare two variants of the same protocol and see uh, the differences. We can take tunable parameters and do this kind of dimensional analysis where we just keep incrementing this parameter and see the impact on the properties, the statistical properties. And just generally see the impact on changes. You commit, you know, into Git, your latest specification. Do you know the full impact that that change has had? So how do we measure statistical properties? Well, TLC has a new generation mode, which is very similar to simulation mode. Marcus might get into the details of that. But basically, it's kind of similar to how you would instrument a normal application. You know, you've got your counters and gauges, which you then look up in Prometheus. We can do the same. So counters for messages sent, how, how many protocol rounds have passed, or how many elements are currently in a queue. Um, but we can't do Walcock time, right? We can't say, uh, will the system respond in another five milliseconds? You know, that sort of stuff we can't do. Sometimes there are proxies, so in some of the systems that I've verified recently have been protocol round based. And a round has, say, you know, on average, two milliseconds or 30 seconds. And so we can use some proxies to kind of correlate to some kind of time period. So anyway, we get all these counters and gauges and things and output to CSV, along with any other attributes that later we want to then do our statistical analysis with. And then after that, it's open to how you want to slice and dice and analyze your data. Marcus and I are fans of R and ggplot2. 
And hopefully, most of the time, we can reuse an existing spec that we just want to add our metrics to or use refinement when that's not possible. So Marcus, he's going to do a demo now and uh, show us a bit about how this technique is, uh, is performed. OK. Guess you can hear me. Let's switch over to VS Code. No, let's not switch over. So yeah, uh, in 2020, when I sent out this tweet, I guess I was on the hook to make something work for, for Jack. Um, it wasn't actually just me, it was Leslie who's been saying for many years that we can easily collect statistical properties with TLC. And in hindsight, it turns out this is all super simple, super naive. It's, it's a, it was a low-hanging fruit that we just plucked. Yeah, we just had to make it convenient. And I think we, we are now at a point where it's convenient enough for more broader use. Um, I'm going to show you one, perhaps two examples. One is Knuth Yao, six-sided die. The other one is a distributed system where we'll test your intuition and then we can confirm it with, uh, with a simulation. Um, quick reminder what um, Knuth Yao is. So you want a six-sided die, but unfortunately you only have a two-sided coin. And now the idea is can you somehow, somehow simulate this die? And uh, Knuth and Yahoo in the 70s proposed the system. You have this graph here, and then you start in S0. You flip the coin. If you get heads, well, then you move to S1. You flip coin, uh, toss the coin again. You go to S3 or S4. And now say you are in S3, and you flip it again. You get heads. You move back to S1. And the big question, obviously, is, is this a fair die? Uh, it's obviously modeling a die, but is it a fair die? I don't know. This loop over there looks, looks fishy, right? Obviously, you can solve this analytically, Markov um, chains, Markov uh, decision procedures. You can also use probabilistic model checkers, such as PRISM, for example. And the canonical example, the intro-level example of PRISM is this particular problem, uh, Knuth Yahoo. Uh, and it's great. PRISM is a great tool. But its language, I would say, is a bit more constrained compared to TLA plus if you want to describe distributed systems. Uh, Hillel wrote a blog post about PRISM where he studied, for example, a multi q system. So it's a great tool. By the way, if you want to learn a bit more about the math that's involved here, how to analytically solve this problem, uh, Joost Peter Katowin wrote this beautiful model checking meets probability, gentle introduction. It's kind of the recap of it. It's great. Go and read it. But here the question, this being TLA plus conf and not prism conf, let's see what we can do with TLA plus. It's, it's easy and straightforward to state the specification of Knuth Yahoo. Yeah? We have two here, and by the way, this was written by Ron Pressler. It's now part of the TLA plus examples. So you can go and look it up. It's all open source. You have this transition table here, T, and then the next state and the initial predicate and the next state relation is that you start in the S0 state, you're here with probability one, and then you use non-determinism to model the, the coin toss. And the next state relation is, for as long as you are not in an initial state, well, you keep tossing the coin, you halve the probability um, of you being in this current state, and you look up the next state. Straightforward, right? What we cannot state in TLA plus is that this is a fair die. We can't. Now, the language is not expressive enough because an LTL or a TLA plus formula is true or false of a single behavior. It's not true or false of all the behaviors. Um, so what we want to, want to state is something like for all D in 1 to 6, the probability of this eventually being this particular value, this particular D is a 1 over 6, but we can't. Okay, fundamental problem, not expressible with TLA plus. Here we will use um, the simulation to empirically validate that we modeled um, a fair die. There are two more problems here. Um, TLA plus, TLC cannot handle reals. Model checking reals is, is difficult, it's hard. Uh, I don't know about the support in, in Appalachia. I guess it's the same, right? Forget about reals, no can do. TLC, actually, there is a reals module, but if you have reals appear in your specification and launch TLC on it, it will just fall over. And then secondly, if you would want to try and exhaustively check the specification, 
it doesn't work because it's an infinite state space because you can infinitely long half the probabilities. So it has by design an infinite state space. But perhaps let's see if we can still find out, validate that our specification here models a fair die. And as I said, all of what I'm going to show you now has sort of been around forever except for polish. Now we added a few more operators here and there, created a new mode in TLC for statistics to be proper, but for you, uh, from your perspective, from the user perspective, this is all supposed to be super simple. So, uh, where's my pointer? Yeah. Oh, oh, I see, hold it. I have to get rid of the presentation here. Okay, here we are. Is this, is this big enough for the people in the back? Yeah, okay. So this is the specification uh, that I just showed you on the slides. There's, except for cosmetic changes, just one major change, which is instead of the reals, I use a module called the dyadic uh, rationals, which is the subset of the rationals whose denominator is a power of two. two. And since here we only have the probabilities, we get away with the dyadic rationals and thus can make TLC accept the specification. It still can't exhaustively check the specification. We will just overflow its internal representation of, uh, of the dyadic rationals, but at least we can simulate it long enough to collect meaningful data out of it, okay? So that's the only change in, 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 in Ron's specification. So the way now to collect statistics is essentially, and it's super straightforward, we have a state constraint, uh, has been around, has been available in TLC forever, and in the state constraint, what we do is, okay, if you are, if we are in a, in a terminal state, in a done state, well then just append the current value of all of the variables to a CSV file. So we just created the CSV write operator. We have a module that has CSV write, CSV read, and a few auxiliary other useful operators. And this allows us to dump TLC state sort of to disk in a convenient format. You could also use a JSON format if, if that floats your boat, doesn't matter. Okay, um, and that's all that it takes. And additionally, for convenience here, I use um, another auxiliary operator that is sort of new called IOXEC, with which I start an R process every 250 traces that TLC generates, okay? And if I now go to the terminal, okay, and if I remove this part here, I run TLC in generate mode. This is this new mode. It's not simulate mode, it's generate mode. This was added to TLC to replace non-deterministic, non-determinism with uh, uniform probabilities. It runs in the background, and if we open this plot that this R file generates, Preview SVG, and we make this somehow bigger. Then you can see that it updates in the background. Yeah, and we collect samples more and more, and the gray bar here kind of confirms that approximate that uh, this is a fair die. All six sides are equally likely. We have a discrete uniform distribution. Go ahead. Uh, can't share the microphone, unfortunately. So maybe. A simple answer is this is way easier, right? Instead of dumping all your traces. And you can also hook into TLC just the right moment. Instead of you going, then going over all the traces again, finding the right state you care about, and then extract the information. But let me get to that later, okay? Makes more sense to answer this question when we look at EWD998. Okay, uh, by the way, the green bar shows that this is kind of a fair, fair coin toss, okay? And the orange bar up there, bar plot up there, um, shows the probabilities of the terminal state. That we have gaps in the power of two here is not a bug in the statistics. It's because with the probability, probability one over 16, you cannot be in a terminal state, if you think about the, uh, this diagram, uh, this graph I showed you earlier, okay? That's the reason why these numbers aren't here. And the probability, the length of the behaviors obviously gets, the probability of longer behaviors gets lower over time. 
Okay, so that kind of confirms that we can validate Knuth Yahoo with, uh, with TLC simulation or generation mode. So now let's see if we can, let's, hold on, let's stop this part here. Let's make this smaller. Let's get rid of this window here. Let's see if we can model a crook coin, okay? Let's say this 10 krona would somehow be bent and would favor one side or the other. Uh, by the way, this is Margrethe II on, on the hats, and she is now Europe's longest serving regent at the age of 82, and she just caught COVID at Queen Elizabeth's uh, funeral. Uh, <laughs> fun fact, uh, I w wish her swift recovery. Um, okay, so how to model is uh, a crook coin in TLC, or in a TLA plus specification. For that, we can kind of use the random element operator in this particular case. We also have a randomization module that came, par, uh, came out of as part of the works on using TLC to uh, validate inductive invariance that I mentioned earlier. So we have a you know, set of randomized operators related to randomization. I use the very basic one here, random element, to pass it a set of eight elements and it's going to return one element, yeah, non uh, probabilistically, uniform probability. If the return value is within one or three, well, then it's tails. If it's heads, then it's, uh, uh, sorry, if it's the other value, then it's heads. Straightforward, right? So let me switch to the config file here, redefine this operator. It's one way of doing it. Go back to the simulation, and by the way, let's make this longer here. Let's generate infinitely long traces. We can go over here, preview this again, bit of clicking, and we see we get a crooked coin. And this is showing the probability in the ultimate state. I'm not tracking the probability over the whole behavior. And we get this new distribution here, the gray bar plot. Is this correct? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, but fortunately, PRISM knows. Okay, so I used the PRISM model checker to uh, check this system, and these are the steady state probabilities. And if you look, one or two are uh, equally likely, then four, three, five, and six. And I think this is approximately what, what's seen here in this graph, right? Seems to com confirm what uh, PRISM predicted just by simulating it. It's no surprise. It's just simulation. Right. You, okay. So, um, so you're saying I changed this from 15 to minus one, right? I meant to run it with minus one right from the get-go. Um, it was just me making a mistake. But it's a good point. It's easy to make mistakes when you do statistics. Yeah, and they might skew your results. Um, it's yeah, as part of working on this. Um, I kept adding ways to validate your statistics at the source, and I kept finding bugs in my, in my data, uh, in my results, which is, from my perspective, another reason why it makes sense, sense to do the data collection inside of TLA+, plus rather than uh, doing it inside of TLC or by exporting all the traces. Um, also, I think, performance-wise, exporting all the traces might be infeasible if you have a large, too large, uh, want to take too large system, right? Um, anyway, let's get back to validating the statistics because that was part of this work. One, one way for you to validate, to make sure that you don't make mistakes is that we now expose a bunch of internal TLC state, its configuration sort of as one of its registers. So you have, we have TLC get config. You can look up various uh, um, fields of it, I can check here that I run TLC in this generate mode and not in, in the simulate mode, which would skew the results. I also make sure that we run it with at least, for at least behaviors of length 15 or even better, infinitely long behaviors and I don't check that logs and so on and so on. So this is one way of validating your data. Um, there's another way of validating your data. So say I generate just a fixed number of behaviors 10,000, I run this. What it should show now, we could look at the, at the output again, but I don't think it's, it's super interesting. It failed, 
Okay, and what it says now here is, okay, so the distribution that TLC collected fails this uh, G square test. And this works because TLC has a new hook, which is called post condition. This is a formula that gets evaluated when TLC is done. Um, and inside the post condition, I so happen to assert that the values that TLC collected in one of its internal registers uh, follow a uniform distribution. Uh, and G square is just one operator we have. I mean, I created it on Monday night. I got excited when I present, uh, worked on the presentation, so I added G square. It's just 10 lines or so that sit on top of Java Commons uh, math, right? You just have to wire up the Java definitions, the Java code to a TLA, suitable TLA plus definition, and then you right away can use um, the statistical analysis. By the way, I also assert here on line 91 that we collect all the traces. If I set TLC to collect 10,000 traces, here I assert that we end up with 10,000 10, traces because if I were to, for example, run it with three, then we wouldn't get 10,000 traces. I have to get rid of this part here, otherwise we're not even allowed to, to check it. But yeah, now it has fewer, fewer samples than we expected. By the way, this is also probably worth mentioning. This here is one way of modeling the crooked coin. Random element in an if then else. What would happen if I had two actions where in the, on each side I use, in each uh, disjunct I use random element? Hmm? Any guesses? This is going to change the outcome of our, of our experiment. Let's see, so this all looks fine. So unless I'm mistaken, uh, make this smaller, this bigger, preview this part. This should look approximately, you know, this is stale data. There's a bug in this. What is it? Has a, oh, it's already done, so it wasn't fast enough. I think if we look at the data, uh, it's starting to approximate the previous distribution. So from the statistics, it's fine, but we didn't generate all the behaviors. And this is what this other assert was about that I had in the post condition. Because now there are behaviors that are cut short because both times random element evaluated to false. And none of these coin tosses were uh, you know, kind of extending the current behavior. Okay, so validation inside of TLI plus from my perspective makes a lot of sense at the source where you collect the data. You can also, uh, it also allows you to model a stateful cone, right? So say I want the probability of, uh, of heads or of tails, doesn't matter, become exponentially less likely over time. Okay, then I have this stateful crooked coin operator here that essentially increases the size of the input set based on the current value of the probability. Doesn't really make sense, right? I mean, you get a different distribution, that's all. Point being that you can use TLCs or the, the, the state of your TLA plus specification of your state machine to also model the probabilities and that way make the probabilities of transitions depend on the current length of the behaviors, for example, or the other, the global state of the system, for example. Uh, if you were to constrain the number of messages that are sent, perhaps this depends on whether or not two servers are up or not, to make something up. Okay, cool. Uh, by the way, I lied when I said this is Ron's specification. It is not. Uh, there is this problem with, uh, with TLC generating the initial states up front atomically. If that's fine if we check the original Knuth Yahoo, but I had to introduce an artificial initial state from where we make an unfair coin toss, if we care about the unfair, the, toss, uh, the crook coin. But I just had to, to add this non-existing init state that takes us to S0 without changing anything else to make TLC only generate this state initially and then all the other states are successor states. That's one trick you can do. Okay, um, we saw post condition, multiple operators, that's fine. So 
Let's test your intuition. Let's talk about EWD998, which is a distributed system. It's a bit more complicated compared to uh, Knuth Yahoo. It's way, way less complicated compared to what uh, Jack is going to show us later. He worked on real systems. This EWD998 is an algorithm that was proposed by a student of Pnueli at a seminar of Dijkstra 20 years ago. Okay, and it, it detects termination in a distributed system. So you have a number of collaborating processes. They exchange messages. And the receipt of a message wakes up a node if it's idle at this point. At a later point, this node may decide to idle again. And now you have one of these nodes who wants to detect whether or not all the other nodes are terminated. Okay? And this algorithm doesn't handle node failure. It doesn't handle message loss. So it's more academic. But it's complex enough to be, to be uh, interesting to be studied with simulation. Oh, sure. Okay, so this is our distributed system here. It's organized in a ring. And the way this algorithm works is that this initiator node passes a token around the ring. Okay, and if the initiator gets the token back, and this token, the state of the token, indicates that the system or the other nodes have terminated, well, then we detect termination. Obviously, we have like asynchronous messages being in flight, so this token somehow captures the number of in-flight messages in addition to uh, the question whether or not the current round is conclusive. And if the current round is inconclusive because A, there are in-flight messages, or B, our round is, is kind of tainted, we do another round, okay? Straightforward. You could study this problem in more detail. Just want to test your intuition here. Because it satisfies these two uh, correctness properties here, safe and live. We never incorrectly detect termination, and should there be termination, we eventually detect it. These two properties are satisfied. The rest is uh, specified according to Dijkstra's writing. But say we were to allow a node to sort of pass on the token not adhering to Dijkstra's protocol, pass on the token uh, when the node is active, but black. If a node is black, it indicates that the current round is going to be inconclusive. In Dijkstra's writing, it says a node holds onto the token for as long as it is active. I say, why not, why not also pass the token if the round is going to be inconclusive anyway? The safety and liveness properties I showed you earlier, they hold. So we have no way of knowing whether or not this is going to make things better or worse. Question? No, okay. Secondly, another optimization that I'd like to propose is, well, we have rounds that are bored here, right? Or that are inconclusive. So why not abort a round? Now, why send the token around the ring when it's going to be an inconclusive round anyway? Why not just return the, the token to the initiator right away? Uh, and the, the underlying network assumes that every node can communicate with uh, all the other nodes. So these are two optimizations, or de-optimizations we don't know at this point, but they don't violate safe and life. Safe and life hold. So what do you think? Is, is A, is this a true optimization? Quick show of hands. Okay. A, A is the other one, the other one, the first one. Uh, is, it up, uh, is it going to make the detection of the termination faster? Because this is what we care about, right? We know that we will eventually detect termination, but it might be eons before we detect termination. So is the upper one an optimization to detect? Yeah, you think so? Okay, anybody else? Okay, how about the, the second one, the lower one, where we eagerly abort, abort the token round? Okay, three, four... Okay, the rest is, is undecided. Okay, that's fine. So let's, oh, we have to make this small again. Let's head over here. So I'm going to spare you the specification of EWD998 itself. It's also part of the uh, TLA plus examples. There's a plethora of auxiliary uh, material there. We have proofs for liveness and for safety. 
Uh, there's going to be a paper that's coming out next week where Igor Konov of Apalachi, uh, Stefan Merz, TLAPS, and me, we kind of analyze EWD from all three perspectives, TLC, Apalachi, and TLAPS. Plenty of material. What I did here is I wrote, uh, where's my pointer? This extra specification, EWD 998 opts. There's a lot of stuff in here. What I want to show you is again that I capture the, the interesting points in time with an action and a state constraint again. So whenever the variable terminated changes its value from false to true, so the system has terminated, we're going to remember the length of the current behavior in this TLC set register. Uh, straightforward. And then in the at termination detected state constraint that once termination gets detected, we write the current values of the variables and also the current length of the behavior again to the CSV file. So now in the CSV file, we have the point in time where, ter where the system terminated and also where we detected termination, in addition to a bunch of auxiliary material I might not have time to show you. Uh, there's also more stuff in here, for example, how I um, check both optimizations and combinations and all, com all various combinations of actually five different com uh, optimizations. If you care about this part, how the automation works, I heard questions about command line optimizations. I have a sort of TLA plus script with which I can drive the simulation here, uh, all in TLA plus. Uh, follow up with me offline, no time right now. but. Uh, we could, whoop, no, that's not it. We could run this, hold it, it's over here. We could run this now and collect new data. It takes about, uh, oh, TLC config, this is it. Takes about two or three minutes to, to run enough, um, enough simulations to, to collect meaningful data. In the meantime, let me just go over here and I hope that R works now has the tendency to fail on me, whoop. Okay, I have to do this, okay. Maybe I have to restart VS Code, sometimes R and I are no friends. Uh, oh, this time it worked, great. So this is now a bar plot again. This is the plot for no optimization, the original algorithm. PT1 is we pass the, the, the token if the node is black, and PT3 is we eagerly return the token when uh, the current route is inconclusive. And as you can see, PT3 is a de-optimization. Yeah? It's, it's, don't do it. Uh, maybe it's because the way I phrased the algorithm here informally that I lured you into thinking that this would be an optimization. But this here confirms that it's a huge de-optimization with very little effort, right? We just collected a few samples. This uh, algorithm is also simple enough to think about this, the reason why this is a de-optimization sort of analytically so on the left, you see the original algorithm. In the worst case, it needs three token rounds. With my proposed optimization, it now needs way more token rounds because what the token does, it not only communicates to the initiator whether or not we have termination, but it also kind of acts as a clean sweep. It whitens all the nodes. And if you abort the round, then you don't whiten the nodes. And yeah. So you, with, this, with this particular protocol, you probably could have figured it out yourself. Um, the message is collecting these statistics is just so dead simple with TLC and the uh, few optimizations and additions we made to the, to the community modules, to TLC, um, that there's no reason for you not to do it. Okay, and I think now Jack is going to show us real-world specifications and real-world insights into those specs. Right, so let's have a look. So I'm going to look at three case studies. Um, RabbitMQ and Kafka based on real world uh, algorithms and protocols where I use the technique. And SWIM is actually a paper 
which we use to kind of develop the technique with. And I'll look at the SWIM use case first. So SWIM is a group membership protocol, um, which is where a bunch of peers will use gossip, use like a, an epidemic infection style mechanism for disseminating information, along with a failure detection component. And some systems have based, you know, are based on SWIM. For example, HashiCorp Surf is the one I know best. And so the basic idea is SWIM. You have a bunch of protocol periods or rounds. Uh, and in each round, uh, there is communication between the different peers. And at some point, let's say one member dies, another member detects it, and after that, disseminates that information in an epidemic style manner. And in each step, in each protocol period, what the specification is doing is it's writing out the current counters, engages, and, all, and key variables to CSV. So we can actually track over time the progress of the propagation of, of information. So the way it works for SWIM is in each round, every member randomly chooses a peer to send a ping to. If they get an ACK, then it's all good. And if they don't get an ACK, then they go to an indirect ping. So they ask a, a peer to do a ping on their behalf. Uh, that indirect ping can be useful, for example, if the, the peer is actually alive, then the indirect ping can get around, say, the network partition, or maybe it was just a transient problem. So SWIM has a number of mechanisms to avoid false positives. Then the information itself is infectious. So B detects that D is dead and sets D to dead in its internal map, and that is now infectious information. And then it can piggyback that information on pings, acts, and ping requests to its peers, and then infects other members. And every time you share a piece of information, counter gets increased until the data becomes non-infectious. Now, an addition to, to the indirect pings is a suspect state. So this is another variant of SWIM where rather than going from alive to dead, we go to suspect. And then you get a certain number of protocol rounds where the actual peer uh, in question is able to refute its deadness and say, actually, I'm alive. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, then it goes to dead. And once you're dead, you're dead. And if you're not, then you've just got to rejoin. So I wrote this up in TLA Plus over a number of sort of evolutions where we were developing the technique. And I wanted to see if the statistics I was generating matches the paper. So I took the first plot here in the SWIM paper, which is about message load, which shows that despite you know, any group size, that the, number, the message load per round remains the same. And when I measured my own, it was basically identical with the same uh, sort of standard deviation. So that gave me some confidence that it was working the same as the paper. Then also another plot was how many rounds for, it to, for a non-faulty member to detect a dead member. How long does it take in general? And the paper also says that regardless of group size, it should basically take the same amount of time. It's quite noisy in their plot because they don't run the simulation very many times per group size. So I run mine a few more times. If I run it 10 times, I get similar data. But if I run it 1,000 times for each group size, I get much more clean data, which is in line with what the paper is saying, that group size does not affect how many rounds it takes for an, um, a dead member to be detected. And so with all of my runs, I end up running each configuration over 1,000, perhaps 10,000 times to get good data. When it comes to differential analysis, SWIM has a huge number of variants and tunable parameters, which uh, you can explore. So something I like to do in actual distributed system testing is dimensional testing, where I'll take a tunable parameter and I'll see the impact of when I change that parameter, what impact does that have on the system? And so when I take the dissemination limit, which is how infectious the information is, we see that when it's not very infectious, it takes many more rounds for the group to converge on the fact that we have a dead member. And that's because we're only relying on the pings and acts, the, the failure detector component. 
But when we make the information highly infectious, we, think we see that we, we get to convergence much quicker. So we can kind of take these tunable parameters as dimensions and explore the impact of changing them. But we don't need to necessarily just take aggregated statistics over 1,000 or 10,000 executions. We can actually, because we have it all in CSV, we can just inspect individual traces. So we can get an idea of, hey, what does a particular trace look like? Uh, and so here's just four random you know, uh, ones I took. And you know, they all have a similar uh, uh, pattern where this is a, a member is, has died, and this is the propagation of that information through the group. We can also look not only at these kind of tunable parameters, but we can compare variants. So here's just two variants. One is just the infection style dissemination, and the other variant is the infection plus suspicion mechanism. And this is all about false positive de dead state propagation. So what I do is I run the SWIM uh, protocol with 10% message loss, which is extremely high. And I run it without the suspicion mechanism. So we're only relying on these indirect pings. And basically, within 25 to 30 rounds, the group comes to a halt because everyone thinks everyone else is dead and they can't make any more progress. And then we see the impact. Well, what happens if we introduce the suspicion mechanism? Well, with a suspect timeout of one, there's not much of an impact. But as we progressively increase the suspect timeout, we see what impact it has on this false dead state propagation. And then I can take that suspect timeout of five, and I can take another tumorable parameter and explore changing that along with it. And we see that actually if we increase the peer group size, which is the number of peers a member asks to do an indirect ping for it, we reduce the, the false uh, dead state propagation even further. So it's a really nice way of exploring variance and tunable parameters. Another thing that I tend to do is make sure that I am running the same, I have the same number of samples for each configuration. So in this case, I was running the simulation for 40 protocol periods. So I, ex and I'm running on the left-hand side, that's the peer group for peer group of one, two, and three. And I expect the same number of samples per round and peer group combination, and I do. On the right, we got the suspect timeout from zero to five, and we see it actually tapers off. I'm not getting the same number of samples for the higher rounds for a suspect timeout of zero. And so this would actually skew my statistics and is a bit of a problem. But it turns out that actually it wasn't a problem. It was because simply with this high message loss rate, the suspect, without the suspicion mechanism, the group just can't even reach the higher rounds because they stop at like 25 rounds because everyone thinks everyone else is dead. And at that point, the specification spits out all the statistics and, and is done. But this way, you can kind of inspect, do you get the distributions you're expecting, do some sanity checking to make sure that the results you're getting is right. So what challenges do we have with SWIM? So probably performance is the top one because I'm running each configuration 10, well, 1,000 to 10,000 times, and I'm doing this dimensional analysis. So I might run group sizes from 5 to 40, and then I might choose suspicion timeout from 0 to 6, along with peer group 1 to 3, which ends up being a couple of hundred configurations, which means up to 200,000 or even 2 million traces that I need to generate. And for the higher group sizes, that can end up taking many, many, many hours. So we had to implement Java overrides. Uh, so that's basically take an action that's in TLA+, plus, implement it in Java, and um, we got some serious speed ups from that. But also, Marcus did a number of improvements to TLC itself uh, to improve performance and the addition of a number of uh, new modules to the community modules, like Quantify, for example. Was, uh, was a big one. Then there's also the specification complexity. The original specification for SWIM is quite small and simple because it's just safety. It's only looking at safety. It doesn't care about all the different variants, which are all about liveness, all the optimizations and the extra rules, which are all targeting liveness. 
And then when you want to implement the entire swim with all the optimization targeted at liveness and do it all in TLC, sorry, TLA plus, it ends up being a lot more complex. Then you've got the additional boilerplate of the actual metrics collection as well. Another case study, and this is where it began, where I was saying at the beginning I tweeted that I'd written a simulation in Python. So this was a client library, the Reactor Streams RabbitMQ library. And this is basically a resource allocation algorithm, but it does it in a cooperative way between clients. And so the idea is that a bunch of clients deterministically, independently, are able to make decisions such that they balance their consumption equally uh, over a group of queues. And it does that using a feature of RabbitMQ called single active consumer. And that's basically where to first come, first serve on a particular resource, a particular queue. So the first client comes along, and it becomes the single active consumer. Another client comes along, client two, it's, it's basically in standby mode because we can only have one active. Three comes along, again, it's at the back of the queue. So if client one disappears, next in line is two, right? So now two is the active consumer. And so that, combined with what the client does, and the client basically, every 30 seconds, it gets metadata from RabbitMQ to learn who are the other clients, and it determines whether it has too many queues. So in this case, client one starts, it's the single active consumer of all three. Then another client starts, it's got nothing. So one says, hey, I've got three, I should only have two. So it gives up one and resubscribes, and then we have balance. But this looked to me to have uh, some problematic liveness. I was pretty sure that if you had like 20 queues and 20 clients, it might take a lot of this balancing where, hey, I'm going to release my queue and now I've got too many. And then they take too long to come to some balance. So that's why I wrote a simulation to uh, find out these statistics. And what was interesting is when you had the same number of clients as queues and that every client should have one queue, we saw this very wide distribution of the number of times each queue had to be released. And it was very problematic, um, even up to 200 times like queues would have to be released for it to gain balance. Um, looking at it with a bit more resolution with this percentiles chart, we see as it approaches the same number of clients as queues, we see this huge peak in the number of queue releases and also the number of rounds. So each round is 30 seconds. So the P99, that would be 25 minutes for this group of clients to agree on who's got what queue. And I went to the library author, I said, this is not going to work. So, oh yeah, and this was another scenario where we take an established stable cluster and we kill one. What happens? Again, we see these huge peaks at 20, smaller at 10. Um, again, the liveness, it was just not good enough. And why was it not good enough? It all really came down to the way single active consumer works in a first come, first serve. If client nine here needs to be the single active consumer, then clients five, then two, then six, four, three, one, seven, and eight have to do a queue release to get it to the front of the line. And if you've got 20 queues, imagine how many releases among all the queues, and that's why we have hundreds um, potentially of releases. So there was actually a really easy optimization why don't we just jump the client that needs it to the front of the queue? And then it becomes the single active consumer. We can do it proactively. And so the way we did it is each client, when it checks how many queues it should have, if it has the right number of queues, but it detects another client doesn't have enough, it unsubscribes from all the queues where it's not the active consumer and resubscribes, which jumps the client that needs it to the front of the queue. And the result was impressive. So I actually tested two uh, optimizations at the same time. One was this non-active release. Another one was a tweak to the ranking algorithm where each client works out how many queues it should have. And what I found was that the non-active release optimization was way, way, way better. And the ranking algorithm change was not. And in fact, it was actually slightly worse. 
And again, the same with the scenario where we start with a stable cluster uh, and kill one client to see uh, how quickly they reach convergence again. And so that was a good success story, and the, client, the library author was able to go, off, go away and implement that change, and, uh, and, and you know, the project was saved. And again, as always, just making sure I get even distribution of all the configurations that I'm running. So I'm running here kind of two dimensions, tests with different number of clients and the four different algorithm combinations. But I had originally coded this in Python. And this whole process of working with the library author, that was all done in Python. I had not done that with TLA+. So all these charts I've shown you so far have been the TLA plus ones. But then I went and actually checked the Python against the TLA plus, and they're remarkably similar. If anything, TLA plus is a bit more pessimistic. It thinks that, uh, you know, it just, it just thinks there's going to be more key releases and, uh, and more, more key rounds. But they are remarkably similar. And lastly, there's Kafka. This is a very quick one. Kafka, again, this is another resource allocation algorithm, but it has a much smaller degree of non-determinism um, because it's all done by the broker. It's a centralized uh, uh, algorithm. But I wanted to check the different assignment strategies. So we have had three strategies historically, round robin, range, and sticky. And one thing we've trying to minimize in this algorithm is the number of times, again, we have to revoke someone's access to a, to a, a, t a topic partition. Uh, and so partition revocations are, we want to avoid. And again, there was interesting, when you, when you look at the pattern, when you look at the number of clients compared to the number of partitions, and you can kind of get these different patterns, which may not be obvious when you're first looking at these assignment strategies. And we see that the sticky assignment is just far, far superior. And then also looking at a, uh, uh, an optimization to sticky to say, well, sticky assignment is a fair algorithm. It tries to allocate perfectly, evenly, the partitions to clients. But what if we care more about stability than fairness? Maybe if we allow us to have a certain amount of unfairness just to avoid this rebalancing. So this is where we basically allow a certain distance from fairness and the impact it has on the number of revocations. And as expected, we kind of see a reduction in revocations as we allow less and less fairness. So that's another example of just checking a tunable parameter. So those are the uh, use cases. Yeah, so basically, we've tried this technique on real-world systems. We checked it on very complex protocols based on academic papers. And you know, in general, we found that it's been a very effective uh, technique to understand statistical properties. Uh, uh, one thing where it didn't work, this is the second bulletin item here, is if your spe specification sort of lacks the unit of measure that you care about, right? Remember the EWD 998 specification, we had a point in time where the system terminated and a point in time where the system detected termination and we could measure the number of times the token was passed in between. Uh, we tried to apply, and this is the first class citizen that you can measure. We tried to apply this simulation to, say, a concurrent algorithm in the hopes of predicting concurrent uh, contention and coherence on locks, right? But because locks typically are not modeled at the level of TLA+, plus, they simply don't exist. You don't suffer the wall clock time that it takes. You don't suffer the cross chatter among the cores in TLA+. Plus. You cannot simulate this. And when I try to sort of come up with just arbitrary numbers as costs for these operations, it was highly sensitive to the, to the actual values. I could essentially predict anything with my choice of the, of the, of the cost. So it doesn't work for system level measure, measures. Perhaps PGO generating the implementation from it and then doing the empirical analysis might work in this area. Um, what's great about this idea here with TLA plus and simulation is that 
you sort of can define your workloads and you can define the perturbations of your system, right? If you do real system level um, empirical um, performance analysis, it's super tricky to get the system into the right state, to be in the expected broken state, to cause the perturbations, to cause 10% message loss. In TLA plus, you define it in the initial state predicate, for example, and then you give probabilities to the faults happening. What would be super nice is, but it doesn't work, uh, if you would state your workloads and also your failures as, part, uh, as fairness constraints, and then the tool would uh, sort of create the, would only generate those behaviors that adhere to the fairness constraint, but this doesn't work. It would, it would require a completely new tool, I guess. Um, what about scalability in the small scope hypothesis? Um, so far, we haven't seen a specification where more nodes, bigger workloads predicted completely new results, right? They only caused the results to be more pronounced. Uh, like with, with the example of EWD998, with 43 nodes, the bar plot was way higher compared to seven nodes where it was not as pronounced. But so far, we haven't seen, seen something, seen an algorithm where with more nodes, a new phenomenon appeared. Um, so it seems like the small scope hypothesis still seems to, to be in effect even for simulation. Um, not sure if you have emergent behavior, stampeding herds, um, in, in case of when you have suffered grave failures or stuff like that, then I suspect that this might not, might not work. The good thing is when it comes to scalability, simulation is just embarrassingly parallel, right? You can just run it on a farm of computers, wait a day, and then get your results back. If you want to make it faster at the level of TLC, like Jack said, uh, use the TLC TLA plus toolbox profiler to find the bottlenecks, write Java overrides for these operators. For most of them that pop up uh, in the real world, we already have like quantify in the community modules uh, and a bunch of other operators um, readily available for you. More recently, I introduced a TLC cache operator where you give it an, uh, a value and then internally TLC will cache what this expression evaluates to. Randomization is crucial here, especially when it comes to um, defining the workload, workload and, and perturbations. Yeah, and if you want to try out this technique, um, please go over to this particular issue on our issue tracker and let's keep the, keep the discussion um, going. Thanks.